Welcome, everybody, to the Finding Hermes podcast. I hope, as always, you're ready to lay your cards on the table and let that God of the mind walk you through the doors you need to walk through. And as I've discussed many times on this podcast and on AM by Gnostic Radio, psychedelics is one way that you can let the, the God of the mind, the God of doorways, take you through many, many great doorways. It's a key. And with us to discuss this, we have Christian Funder, who will be discussing his book, Grandmother Ayahuasca. Christian, thank you very much for coming on. Thank you for ha having me. I'm honored to be here. Uh, pleasure is all mine. And uh, as we were talking before, there is uh, a lot of parallels with your life and my life, for sure. Um, and we definitely see the world in uh, uh, the same way, and hopefully others can see it in a new way where these uh, these spirits can work for a better world that is uh, definitely much in need of help. So um, let's start with you and why you decided to write the book. Uh, how did you become involved in uh, with entheogens? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll try to answer both questions. So my first experience with with uh, with entheogens or psychedelics was was actually in bali when i accidentally i ordered a mushroom pizza <laughs> mushroom, yeah, I, I laughed and, at that part i laughed <laughs> yeah yeah but then i i didn't you know they were famous for their magic mushrooms and maybe i should have <laughs> anticipated this but then i just you know had this very special pizza and it was very very profound experience you know i i actually did it alone so no trips it or anything but mm -hmm. i just sat there by the ocean eating my pizza and then at some point you know everything just got so in you know emotionally felt pregnant of feeling and intensity and i was just witnessing this miracle unfolding while i was sitting there crying in my chair you know uh, out of this tears of you know, in, in intensity and happiness and beauty stuff. So we're very profound. But um, then what, what brought me to ayahuasca, what, what the book is about, there was a suicidal depression. Mm -hmm. um, I felt like I tried everything and I was on the, I, I was far out. I, I was, you know, contemplating how to kill myself and stuff. And then I just, I had a friend talk about uh, dimethyltryptamine and I was like, yeah, yeah I got to try everything at least. Like I, I have to do that for myself. And then I went for it. I, I, I took my trip to Peru and then I, <laughs> I just had the, the, the trip of a lifetime, but not only positive, right? It's, it's, a, it's a lot of stuff, but it was revolutionary. I think it's a good word. And then these, you know, past three, four years has just been trying to integrate or land i'm still integrating i guess <laughs> yeah yeah and uh, for the audience uh christian's book is uh, not just about ayahuasca but it's about uh, philosophy mysticism it's a very broad book as as i mentioned on how we've become disconnected with the cosmos as you quote carl jung and how we can become once again connected to our ancestors, to ourselves, to the world. So your book is uh, very encompassing, I would say. And of course, uh, you quote a lot the work of uh, Terence McKenna. How did he inform mm -hmm. your views? Was this after your uh, ayahuasca and you struggling with depression or were you always into him? Uh, I, I so so after the experiences, right? After I, I my, like my ontological sand castle just has been destroyed, you know, by <laughs> by psychedelics. I, I just got it was it's just so weird, you know. It's like you you're invited into this incredible mystery, which establishes some kind of ontological priority. You can't question the validity of what has happened. You just have to deal with it. And that was just way too crazy. And it didn't suit with with the worldview that I've been handed. So I kind of feel like, okay, I'm kind of a curious person. I, I think I could call myself. So I just, I didn't accept the fact that this, this was so weird. So I just, you know, I, I, I quit school and I just studied and read and, you know, meditated every day, all the time, just because this, I couldn't just leave this to it, you know? And then I found Terrence McKenna and Eldu Huxley and Henry Bergson and Schelling and Whitehead and all these, uh, 
you know, philosophers that has become deep a part of my life. They may be dead, but they are, you know, they, they're very dear to me and their philosophies has deeply helped me integrate my way back into this world. Um, so yeah, I met, I think if you're a psychedelic explorer, you kind of meet Terence McKenna along the way somehow. <laughs> You have to. I mean, the men's work is groundbreaking on all yes. on all fronts when it comes to psychedelics. And I love in your book, you talk how, uh, as Jung said, we've been disconnected with the cosmos. But to Terence McKenna, we've become disconnected to the chaos. And by chaos, mm -hmm. I think of uh, the dream time, the lunar world, uh, the right brain, the holistic, the serpent, you know, the part that civilization to be more efficient kind of marginalized and we've become our collective psyche has become unbalanced and uh you were talking it was uh very touching how you you talk about your depression and i could relate because like you for years every day i was just miserable i was like uh, the movie the joker or <laughs> donnie darker you wake up every day and you just feel like hell and at some point it seems death is a step up and uh, mm. suicidal thoughts. And I was reflecting, well, why was I depressed? And then I kept thinking of uh, recently I've learned, uh, I think, who hit it on the head. A friend showed me a quote by, I think it was James Hollis, and it talks about when you want to die, you don't fit. What happens is that your worldview is wrong, and it's your worldview that needs to die so that your ego can find a new purpose and each one of us has a different purpose. And I think, uh, do you think that's what happened to you? You were caught in the wrong worldview. You thought uh, Christian had to die, but what had to die was this worldview of uh, the solar civilized logical worldview and something more organic had to come through and the psychedelics helped break that open. Uh, I think that's a very interesting quote and a very interesting way of seeing it. I think there's a lot of truth to it. I think the worldview, the the edifice that that we are walking around is very unhealthy, very wrong. Uh, as I see it, I may be wrong, but I think the the normal secularization thesis is that uh, uh, God is dead and science has explained everything away, and we are living in a world of dead matter um it, all this stuff right but 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 and this is horrible we, we don't see ourselves as part of nature we don't feel the magic feeling everywhere around us as the shamans did and and we just we laugh at them and call them morons who project their own consciousness onto nature and that's such an embarrassment for for us to 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 be able to not only disagree but to do it in this arrogant way and i think what the psychedelics do and I'm not saying that there are other doors into this mystery, right? But they shed off these cultural layers and take you into this felt primal body, magical mystery, very intense mode of pregnant feeling where it's everything is just you, you feel the world around yourself, right? You, you, you see that the mind is some kind of gateway into this cosmic experience you're part of, right? It's just, Reality is magical, and we shouldn't explain that away, right? It's beautiful, but it's intense. And I also think that this intensity is what scares us in many ways and why we guard ourselves from it, right? Um, but Heidegger is one of the philosophers who said that it, um, it's very important. The, the way we see the world, our worldviews are not unimportant. We can't just disregard them because, yeah, you can think whatever you want because the truth is just the truth, you know? But because we are a forcing agent, we, we manifest the world we think we live in. So if we think we live in a world that is of dead matter, in a, like a machine, and we are opposed from it, then that's the world we create, right? It's, it's very important to change worldviews, yeah, I think. That's really well said, and I, I certainly agree with you on that one. And uh, yeah, and the paradox is uh, we become connected to the world, to nature. We become connected to ourselves, our true selves, primary selves, the selves, the selves that, that has a purpose, which, again, Jung, individuation, which is doing what you're supposed to be doing in this earth, your purpose. We all have one, and we've become disconnected. And when you talked about your... Um, experience in peru it reminded me of me doing uh ayahuasca ceremonies with santo daime 
and I, I left. Yeah, yeah, I was with the church in, Very uh, cool. in Portugal. Um, and I laughed because the, well, uh, with empathy, because the horror you experienced the first two days brought me back to the horror I experienced because, yeah, it was like all my insecurities and fears and worries and doubts were hit on me but a thousand times all my bad memories were attacking me and I'm sitting there doing this like funny Christian music and dancing around in a white shirt and blue <laughs> pants and eat and nails. I love you. And, and I'm thinking, I, I, this is worse than death. This is hell. <laughs> and then all of a sudden you are guided, you trust the shaman and suddenly you are taken to a place you break out of your ego and you are in the most amazing place of insight and connection and revelation. It's as I was telling somebody last night, uh, doing a podcast I was on, it's very much like the mystery traditions or the Gnostic rituals where you start out, you go down into Hades and you meet the, mm. you meet the Hades or Saturn or these demons and they attack you. Jesus going down into hell for three days or two days. And then suddenly you are able to leave and go through the stargates and go to Olympus. So I could relate to it. And uh, that it was a great experience you shared. Yeah, but I, 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 you know, I'm, I'm very happy to hear that you had a great experience as well. It, it's very interesting to me, this whole Santo Diamond tradition, you know, with because they don't do it, uh, quote unquote, normally. They, they dance for hours and all this stuff. And I just... I've done eight hours. I, I've done eight I, hours I, straight. I, but it's very intense because I can only imagine sitting there on my mattress just because it even getting up or it, it's I way too much for me. But there's also something about dancing and letting the emotions and stuff flow through you in the dance. And, you know, I, I, I because I remember also at a ceremony, I just sit been sitting down and everything was kind of stuck. Then I got up to the toilet and stuff and by walking and moving around also move the energy around the body and just well, I got out something else stuck. so it's interesting to dance yeah yeah it's incredible and i remember it was uh it might not work these days but uh you do santa dime it's men on this side women on that side okay. and they're very alchemical they're like there's a female there's an anima and an animus and they must be balanced we can't uh we can't change it around and of course like you talk about there's the hours of these really goofy songs but they're perfect for the mm -hmm. uh for the ritual because again every time i did the ritual it was the same thing going down into hell rising into heaven having a revelation or an out-of-body experience and just being uh really completely transformed by it yeah yeah it's it's really interesting this it, it, it can it, it's kind of <sighs> Normally we see we, we think suffering is bad and, and you should avoid it and all this stuff. But the the, the whole part of feeling horrible and, and, and all this stuff leaving you and this bowl of emotional and physical horror going through you, it's unbelievably horrible. But it can be so liberating to get these things out and have them felt and get them through you. Because normally we just medicate everything away. I feel bad anxiety medicine. I feel bad. Take a painkiller. Just. We don't want bad emotions, but they need to be felt and go through us to experience them not being there, right? Um, and I also think what you say about this, because this is really a theme for me at the moment, I, and I'd just like to share it, that um, what, what, what does it mean that we get revelation and, and these uh, information and all this insight pregnant with feeling and everything in this uh, mind psychedelic space? And I just... I, I just really like to play with the thought that, that it works for me, that, that I think it's because we're accessing what Plato and Aristotle talked about and many others, but they talked about this overmind, this divine mind, this thought thinking itself, uh, th this collective mind in which we all share it, in which we all participate as individual expressions of it. And it's just, this is how the shamans got all this incredible information because they access this greater mind of which we are part of and which uh, Goethe says we can learn to participate in by making ourselves worthy of nature as a process, right? It's just so interesting to me. Oh, I agree. And yeah, and I'm, we talk about, you and I talk about revelation and mysticism, but as you do in your book, Grandmother Ayahuasca, and you spend a lot of, you provide a lot of research, 
we're not really, it's not even mystical, but it's seeing reality for what it is. It's almost like it's our birthright, our inheritance to be able to see the entire world and ourselves as we truly are. Is uh, There's a quote by uh, Caitlin Johnstone, and I really love it. She's a writer. It's right here, and it goes, uh, psychedelics are useful not for the hallucinations they provide, but for the hallucinations they remove. So we oh, are amazing. Saying, so that's, that's yeah. what we're seeing. And then there's another quote by Jung um, where he talks about, uh, let me quote it too. The, it's from his letters from 1975. Mm-hmm. And it goes, uh, the idea that hallucinogens could produce a transcendental experience is shocking. The drug merely uncovers the normally unconscious functional layer of perception and emotional variants, which are, psychologically transcendent but by no means are transcendental in other words mm. you're saying this opens up to what we were meant to see reality mm. yeah and it's what 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 i personally think and what you're also saying kind of in the quotes and yourself is that th- this is not just the Im- imagination playing tricks on us i think we the, the mind is just or your experience is upgraded your glasses of perception doors of perception is enhanced so you're able to see more of reality. And then I think the actual hallucination, that is the idea of bifurcation between us and nature. The, 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 the you know, illusion that hallucination that everyone agrees to, that even the dictionary agrees to. <laughs> and then when we do these things, then the boundaries dissolve. You, you access your greater mind, your greater spirit. You mm-hmm. see yourself as a part of nature. Everything is like, breathing and living and not only yourself everything is alive that's what the shaman said once you know that spirit is interfused through everything and we laugh at that stuff now and call them you know yeah <laughs> the term is woo woo here in the united states <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but it, no but it is true but it's it, it is our natural state i believe it's how we used to be it's how animals communicate and plants communicate and it's a. Uh, I say the word holistic, but it's just uh, we become, and I keep repeating, we become very cut off from the source. And I love how um, in your book you talk about uh, the spirit. The ayahuasca is not just a plant, but it is a spirit that speaks to us and guides to us. There's one section where uh, there's these uh, uh, tribe in Colombia that call it Oni. And mm. only translates into wisdom. So, of course, I'm yes. thinking of Sophia, the great goddess of the Gnostics that Christianity and Judaism marginalize. And, of course, your book talks about the Gnostic on the origins of the of the world and all that. And, of course, it's been established that the Gnostics were shamans or they, they were looking for ecstatic experience, probably within theogens and some, if we can... It seems to be pretty obvious in some of their texts. So what are what are some of the views, Christian, of how the indigenous people see ayahuasca as a goddess, as a spirit, or how else? Um well uh it it, it is the name for the for, 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 for the medicine you drink, but behind the medicine it's not just uh, as as we would call it neurons and uh, molecules interacting. There's a living, breathing plant spirit behind this medicine. And for each medicine, there's a different spirit with a different personality and different things to teach you. But but ayahuasca is is the well. I think it is the Santo Daime tradition who calls uh, her the queen of all teachers or the teacher of all teachers. Right. So a very powerful spirit, which is who is female, and um, living uh, intelligence taking care of us with compassion and love. And I just find this so incredibly interesting because to the Western rational mind, that is just laughable that a plant is, has a spirit and it can talk to you and it's wise. And I would say so much, horribly much wiser than I can ever hope to be. And I don't even want to compete. You know, I just, <laughs> um, but, but, but also, I think it is also somehow interwoven with this idea of the conscious earth and that, that it is somehow speaking to us through these plants, that it is the kind of communication. And 
I just find this very, very interesting to relate to the idea of the, the um, well, Whitehead Scott, but also Plato's, uh, sort of Plato's, um, the, the, the trio, trio of the good, the true, and the beautiful, because it is just, to me, the, these plants and, and these spirits, it is just the purest, most perfect, incredible, wise example that, that we can learn from it's just for me it's just very natural real of, of course they are our teachers of course this is like going to school of course this is how we should learn from the living planet from from which we grew right we're not opposed to nature we're children of this living intelligence interfused through everything and it just it why it talks about this um um that there's this lure for feeling of a consequent nature of god which is like the uh, experience the process holding all other experience which he calls the fellow sufferer who understands who guides us towards truth and beauty self transcends all the time and it's just makes sense to me makes sense <laughs> yeah beautifully said and uh it, there's another part of your book you talk about another colombian legend and it goes that uh, how ayahuasca came and it was uh there was the sun father who impregnated the woman of the earth with his gaze and i really love that there's beautiful mythology it reminds me too of uh in the the gnostic the secret book of john that's how creation happens is that the the one impregnates the 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 divine female presence far below by looking into her and these things are created. Whoa. So, uh, it re and of course the idea, as you mentioned, Santo Daime, where you have, uh, uh, Ireneos, Maestro Ireneos, she's walking through the woods and this woman appears ah, and yeah. teaches him how to put these two plants together. And it's, a uh, amazing legends. Uh, any other favorite myths from, uh, from, uh, South America that you like? Uh, they, they, I think I, I really like the, the two stories you just said, especially the one about Irino, where he was taken into the forest and fasted and met this beautiful being that who told him to do this. Um, I also, I, I, I wrote about the other story in the, in the book about Yube, about where, where he, uh, fell in love with this snake woman who told, mm. uh, uh, who taught him about ayahuasca. And it's hard to say what's true and what's not. And I, to, to some extent, I don't even think it's relevant. I just think it's interesting how there are all these different stories of how, and they all share the same theme, kind of the ones I've read mostly, that the plants or the snakes or the spirits taught them to make the medicine. Um, that, that, that is what I find really interesting, ultimately. Yeah, um, indeed. And yeah. Um... And uh, for the, t let's get into a little technicality. Tell us how ayahuasca is made and what are the effects on the brain? And I know I my uncle used to teach me how to make ayahuasca, but I was, you know, that was Whoa. years ago. No, I completely ignored him because I was not okay. wise. I just wanted the effects, you know. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but tell how is it made? Okay. So it, it's kind of a unique thing because normally for, for example mushrooms you just eat and cacti you just oh, that's a bit more complicated because you can grind it into powder or do stuff but it's only one ingredient you do something about but ayahuasca is a synergistic relationship between two jungle ingredients so you need diamond you need uh, shakruna leaves which contain the active powerful psychedelic molecule which is dimethyltryptamine and then you need another ingredient which is the vine the ayahuasca vine and normally you if you only eat the leaves with the dimethyltryptamine it will be immediately broken down by enzymes in your stomach but that's why you take the ayahuasca vine because they inhibit the en enzymes that that would break down the dnc and it's allowed to be processed in the body and there are stuff like harmaline tetrahydroharmaline and harmol, which is psychoactive in the ayahuasca vine alone. Some would jump, just chew that as well. But the mix is really, really powerful. And what I think is very interesting, which we also have talked a bit about already, is how did they know to mix these two plants? It's just a freaking mystery. And I don't buy the trial and error thing because there are like 80,000 plant species in the Amazon. It's a 
jungle out there, literally. <laughs> so we're, we're, we're tiptoeing over a real mystery here. And, and, and I believe that the plant spirits taught them. Um, and I guess if I hadn't tried ayahuasca, I, I would be skeptical. But something is going on with this stuff that, that is not easily understood with, with this thing up here. Yeah. And what are the, uh, scientifically, what are the effects on the brain? What does it do exactly? Okay. Well, that is a bit more tricky. Um, psychedelics generally have an effect on the brain that it kind of, uh, I don't know how much detail I should get into here. I'll try to explain it briefly that it inhibits something called the default mode network, which is a kind of, a set network of different brain areas that normally has the job of um, controlling and structuring the brain. So, so, so it's very rigorous in its way of operation, but psychedelics kind of shut this mechanism down with the structural rigorous mechanism and the brain is allowed to communicate and operate more freely, um, which then allows uh this expansion of consciousness because um the, the the normal survival mechanism of the of the brain is seized is is let down and more of the what i would call this greater mind in which we participate that is normally limited because it's too much for us to handle is let in and you access this cosmic nature of your being yeah kind of i think that <laughs> i hope that was somewhat okay <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Maybe um, it wasn't too technical even. No, yeah. no, no, no. People can do... Google is your friend out there if you <laughs> want the charts and everything of the brain. And, and ayahuasca, it, it is considered the most, what, potent narcotic in the world? Um. Well, so, some people say that salvia is above it, but but I'm not. Uh, it's not like a rank list. I definitely say ayahuasca was way up there as dimethyltryptamine. Um not uh, yeah i wouldn't recommend anyone starting there for sure no no i mean even <laughs> as we talked i remember going to my my uncle's church and he'd have the diamond diamond there and i'd be like there is no way on earth i'm doing this alone the the thought of doing ayahuasca by myself terrifies me more probably more than death because it's it's something. Wouldn't you agree? It's something you really do need the uh, the Buddhist sangha or the egregore. You need a a leader to take you for it to be worth anything, right? Definitely, it, it's it's just <laughs> so powerful. Yeah. Um, and it just you first of all being in a room with other people who is there to heal and share with love and all this stuff. You create an energy in the room which you all are nourished and helped by and strung together in this web of love and an inter experience. And then the songs, which guides you about the shaman, the Icaros, the people that helps you if you're in trouble. Mm -hmm. um, and I just, I could not imagine that it's completely crazy for, I know people do this alone and I guess, okay for you, but I just couldn't imagine. And it, it's, it's hard to understand, but you can get to a point where 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 you just you can't you don't even necessarily know how to breathe right you 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 might need help with stuff and uh, you might sh you know shit your pants and it's nice to maybe possibly get some maybe help with that because you don't want to shit in your sit in your shit for hours right it's just <laughs> very basic stuff you might need help with yeah it's a complete purging it's a purging of your egoic constructs that are as we talk you in our, you your life and my life it, it were actually deleterious to our psyche we had the wrong view of the world and it's certainly purging to the body i would laugh because there'd be rituals where i'd be like all right, I'm gonna. I ate before the ritual. Of course, I'd be running to the bathroom and blah, and just it was just painful. But then there's rituals where I would still fast the whole day and I'd still be going to the bathroom. Yeah, and then I yeah. realized it really is purging every cell in mm -hmm. my body, my psyche, my whole my aura is being purged. It's it, this purging element is so interesting to me. It's I, I think it's very, uh, I've gone through some powerful purges and it's really, really uncomfortable, really uncomfortable. But, and I don't understand because I fast too. 
what is but i because i'm seeing what is going out it's horrible it's uh, it feels horrible and it kind of gathers into this ball which kind of slowly moves through you and it has a personality and way it looks and all this stuff and it's alive and it gets out and i'm like we think that this body is just you know sinews and bones and muscles but it's you're just you're just inhabiting some kind of magical creature and i I really like what Schelling says that that what is happening is that nature we are nature giving birth to itself Na everything from the beginning it was atoms and gas constantly transcending itself to feel more and become more of itself and here we are in this cosmic achievement with this magical thing we just inhabit each of us it's just and it is absolutely a freaking mystery what is going on right here. Yeah. It's, indeed. It's, indeed. Yeah. yeah. You realize your body is an entire cosmos on itself. And what you think of it is uh, completely different. And uh, I, it's interesting. For example, my uncle, he did it for years. So he could actually like take a little, you know, ayahuasca and go out and do his day, grow plants, go see friends. Cause it was, and then the, you go to the Amazons and you have the big, uh, ayahuasca villages and kids are taking this very potent drug mm -hmm. that would knock any adult, but they're used to it. It's part of their life and they're connected to the forest and their diets are great. So it is, uh, it is fascinating. So I guess this leads me to the other advice, and I've stressed this on the show and many other places, is that don't go at it alone, right? You need a good uh, hero fan or shaman or elder to take you there, right? Very much. And I'd also, not only that, but I would also, not just anyone. There are many charlatans out there that just want your money, and some also, I just have to say how it is, some also just want to take advantage and have sex with you. Um, when you're under the influence of this stuff. Right. So just have have them recommend it, wh whoever you're going for. It's really important. This is not for fun. It has to be done the, the right way when you go into these realms because it be, can be such a powerful experience in, in many ways, good and bad, uh, depending on how it is done. And then also, I just have to say that if you are about to do this, just do your homework. If you're on some kind of medicine, research the interactions because it can lead to something called serotonin syndrome. If you're on, uh, what's it called? Antidepressants, SRIs, SSRIs, mm -hmm. for example, which is, can be lethal. So just do your research. And I also very much recommend meditation because I think uh, psychedelic practice, I, a, a lot of the people I do it with, we basically just sit for 10 hours and meditate. So it's nice to have familiarized yourself with your own spiritual interior before, you know, go to the swimming pool before you go into the ocean, you know? <laughs> <I'd say. laughs> yeah, you, you do talk in your book, uh, Grandmother Ayahuasca, about meditation and how it's important. And it reminded me of this quote by Aldous Huxley. It goes, uh, an idiot doing acid is still an idiot, uh, is still an idiot on acid. So in other words, the, it, uh, what he's saying is the, the, the psychedelic isn't going to cure you. There's a lot more to it. You have to put uh, a lot of legwork into it. Yeah, it reminds me of a quote from Terrence McKenna as well. He said that um, it is about the drug, but it's also about the monkey who's taken it, right? It, it's, it, it's, it, you, you bring yourself, and that's what I think is so interesting. I did... Uh, as uh, Wachuma with a shaman in uh, Peru this summer. And he said that when we did the, the drink, which is an incredible teacher as well, Wachuma. And he said that uh, we're all drinking the same after each of us has shared completely different experiences. We all drank the same medicine. Isn't that interesting, right? So it's not like everyone is experiencing a completely different adventure, which is to me saying that this medicine is just showing your own interior to yourself, showing what you have to work with, what you have to deal with, the place that you have to go to and see that it's just a teacher for you, right? It's, yeah, I think it's real beautiful. And I think it's great that you uh, you are a fan of Eldu Huxley as well. I just, I love him so much. Have you read Doors of Perception? Oh, yeah, of course, of course. Yeah, yeah. what do you think about it? Oh, it's a great book. Definitely a seminal book and based on, obviously, William Blake, uh, 
as you mm. quote him, if we cleanse the doors of perception, yeah. we see everything as it is, infinite. I think that's what the plant does, the spirit, uh, this woman in the forest. And I love how you just said it's a, it's a teacher because we all will travel a different path with ayahuasca. Like the first time I, I got married and I had my wife do ayahuasca, and she's a very, uh, uh, lo she was back then a loyal Catholic. So, of course, what we saw was different. I would, I would see mm. uh, visions of serpents because I'm into Gnosticism. It was positive. She would see a serpent and she knew it was evil and would scream mm. at the serpent right there in the middle of the room, mm. you know. So it, it really, like you said, we're all going to, our cultural backgrounds and everything are going to influence the images and symbols we see. Very much. And I also, I, I just, I'm, I'm really, it, it's, it's really also a thing for me that this theme that you're going through about how we've been how we've been separated from, from this part of our dimension. And I really think that it ultimately, like all this that we're seeing, all this that, that, that is going on with the world, it's ultimately just a projection of this disease of disconnection. I see we don't feel ourselves in the world anymore. And this is the price we pay for this breakup of this guy in exile, right? Mm -hmm. Because what I think is, I'm not, I, I'm not an advocate. I'm just, I'm not going to force anyone to do this, but I think if there was once every month, every full moon in every greater city, a possibility for whoever felt the call to participate in a ceremony, not just mass producing pills with psychedelic stuff in there, ceremonies with songs and love and openness and shamanism, nature, then there would just happen something radically different because not feeling yourself as a part of the living world and living mystery from which you are growing and see yourself as this isolated stranger in a world of dead matter that is toxic stuff that's like a fish away from water and i'm not i'm not a missionary i'm not going to come here and say what's right and wrong whoever believes what they're going to believe but i do think that it's important that we see and feel ourselves as a part of this living breathing planetary mystery right it's yeah i think that's beautifully said uh christian and uh we are we certainly are very much uh disconnected i mean even there are people you hear scholars and talking heads for example uh jordan peterson he's like well this is the best time there's less poverty there's less war there's more progress and statistically he he's 100 percent right and so in others However, then they kind of forget the part of how suicide rates, depression, mm. anxiety have never been worse in the human condition. I'm sure you. And see also, it just too. What, what does he mean with progress? Yeah, that's yeah. just an interesting word to contemplate. Like, what does progress mean? Because I would, I, I would say that whatever they think is progress at the moment is very much not progress. It's not freedom to buy more stuff. It's not. Uh, I, I guess it's nice that there is peace and stuff, but more buildings and more all this stuff, that, that's not necessarily progress, more money, more. It's a, a, And I think that we are just kind of this Western enterprise. It's kind of this weird thing that, mo that, that has convinced itself that it knows what's going on and has claimed authority of knowledge and wisdom of everything. And we just kind of want to spread this thing everywhere. And everyone who's not into this, they are just wrong and needs to be converted. And, and and I think it has to be the other way around. What these pre-modern tribes know and feel in their bodies, like felt knowledge while we were living in this desert of abstraction is something we very much need. They need to come and teach us what it means to be a human being, right? What, how to live, how to understand yourself as a part of the forest. And what I think is these psychedelics to me, they're just teachers. To and, and and psychologists and 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 doctors to help you heal your body and your deluded worldview, <laughs> right? It's yeah, yeah. Challenge you. They are uh, Satan or the Egyptian god Set. These beings that challenge your your constructs and and break them down are positive too. And at the same time. Um, 
We is uh, again from your book. You quote Terence McKenna, who says, "I believe uh, that uh, the governments. It's not that they're against us having psychedelics, is that they want us to have corporate psychedelics, mm. right? They want yeah. us to have as opioids and all that, and that has added to the destruction of our collective psyche too. You would agree? Yeah, it's it. It's kind of a, a grim side of it, and. I'm not going to say what's right or wrong. It's just interesting that the drugs that are allowed are the drugs that they prescribe and are addictive and kind of subscribe to this whole consumerism idea, right? More alcohol to, you know, get a numbing break from the material grind, more caffeine to make you more productive, um, more pills, more everything, but stuff that makes you question things and open your mind and challenge ideas and, and and escape you from this red race of consumerism and this stuff. That's not good. No, no, <laughs> away with that, right? Yeah, not at all. But are you worried about? Um, I don't know how to explain this. It's very positive. I don't know how it is in Denmark, but here in the United States, uh, obviously, cannabis is becoming recreational everywhere. Uh, mushroom therapy, psilocybin, is becoming more accepted. There are programs now. Uh, the ayahuasca has been challenged by a few churches, and the the judges have ruled for it that it's a, it is allowed. It seems there is a movement to allow this going in, but at the same time, I worry because already some people in Silicon Valley are saying, well we can make ayahuasca part of the pharmaceutical industry and make it into pills. And I'm like, oh, no, don't, you know, don't commercialize this shit. What are your views on this or what do you think? Yeah, I, I, I don't remember who, you know, there's so many quotes. I don't remember who, it just, it, it breaks, gets up to my mind. He says, it's not only about the biochemical weaponry, it's about the environment. It's about the setting. It's about the intention. It's about the songs the community, the nature, the people, the shaman, all this stuff that is so important for it also to be there and be a great experience. Because I think if we just commercialize it, put it into pills and make it mass produce money discount, you already see it with Compass Pathways wanting to overtake it and earn more money. And it's just don't capitalize this stuff. It's I just I get angry almost thinking about it, that we can take this sacred lifeblood of a dying culture, of our living con connection to this living, breathing, beautiful mother and, and, and make it about the money and just take the magic out of it. It just, <laughs> it's, uh, it, it has to be integrated somehow, but I just hope that we respect the thousands of years of knowledge and tradition that this has been part of, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. Well said. I can't think of anything worse than driving to the pharmacist and then popping this pill in my car. You're a hundred percent right. There needs to be a ritual. There needs to be a journey. There needs to be a, a creativity for this for these spirits to work in our lives. And how is it in Denmark? I mean, Denmark is a pretty secular place. I mean, are you are you sort of on the outside and the liminal places on the edges? Uh, you are the woo woo there in Denmark. No, you are. Uh, you, it's going better for you, you guys, than it is for us. Um, oh, you really? It's no, yeah, not much is happening. That's that's basically it. Um, <laughs> it it's <laughs> everything is still illegal. Um, oh, it is still illegal. Wow. Yeah, and uh, it's just it's not so such a hot thing in Denmark. I think you're 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 ahead of a you're ahead in a in America, but I do also think you're right. And when we have to say positive, because I think we are opening up to these worlds. It's just a matter of how are we opening up to these worlds? And that's the whole problem about integration. How is it integrated? Um, yeah. Oh, wow. And so when you I, do I, these I wanted to say something. <laughs> uh, when you do these ceremonies, you do them in Denmark or you have to go to Peru or the Amazons to do them. I, do mushrooms here. I grow them myself. Uh, a very, very nice process of growing mushrooms. Um, you, you give them love while you grow them and stuff. Uh, very beautiful. And then when I have to do uh, 
more powerful stuff like ayahuasca and wachuma. I haven't done too much. I do it maybe once a year or something. Then I go to Peru because I just have some really nice places that I like to visit and some friends over there I like to visit. And I just, the retreats I've been on, the friends I've made there, it's just crazy how close we become. And I'm not saying I don't have close friends here in Denmark, but meeting people who are also on this journey with plants and, and, and live in this dimension. And, and we get into this loving hippie community where we just love each other and play music and, and just share and open. And oh, it's so beautiful. And I think that's what the plants help us do, right? To, to open and be vulnerable and to feel and to all, all this stuff that, that is just shut down normally. Right. Mm, yeah. And I love the warning in your book. You're talking about love and all that. And you do point out that you had the hippie movement, which <laughs> really embraced psychedelics and drugs. But the problem was, is that as you write, you inject all these drugs into a movement with no leaders, no shamans. It's just a, a free for all. And it ended up doing more damage than good. The hippies became yeah. dissolution. They became yuppies. They became the most materialistic people in the world. So again, you stress if we're going to let these psychedelics, we got to worry about the government and their, and the businesses and their desire for money on one side. And on the other side, like you said, we can't go into hedonism. We need teachers for the plan to teach us. We need ritual and teachers. Yeah. And it's hard because the, the hippies were just interested and curious and they just took whatever. But, 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 but just l let's listen to the people, the shamans, the tribes who've done this for maybe hundreds and thousands of years. There, there, there may be a reason that they all share the way in which they do it in a ritualistic setting with shamans and songs and respect and humility and all this stuff. And I just, I just doing a psychedelic and going to a party think like, I just, it's, it's completely insane to me. And I guess I, I'm not going to say what's right. I, I respect people who do that, I guess, but it just, it just doesn't work for me. It just, there, there's just, and I think it's really important to, to bring in human. It's a way to respect the plant teachers as well to, to 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 have this room where you do it where it's not just going to a party or popping a pill before work to make you more productive i really get triggered by that there's a lot of I, uh, uh, there's a lot of these articles and stuff which says that psychedelics can make you more creative for work and productive and, and it's, you've misunderstood it's not about making more <laughs> money it's it, that's not what this is about it, it's it, i just think it's so important that that we get information and this stuff <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And, and have you uh, seen any studies that show, scientific studies that show the benefits of ayahuasca? Something you might want to share with the audience? Um, yeah, uh, I, I wrote a whole section of uh, studies in the book about benefits from ayahuasca. And it was, and I, also I have a whole chapter, which I, yeah, you read about all, all, all the experiences from different participants. And yeah. it's not always nice. It's sometimes also just horrible. It's not always pleasant. Yeah. But people say that even though it is a, a hard time they have, then this hard time is revolutionary for them. Something has been let go. They feel lighter. They feel more clarified. Emotions were processed. They have to be felt to be, to get over them. Um, and people felt better, more connected to nature, more spiritual, less violent, uh, less prone to alcohol. Le they, st depression subsided and they, they didn't feel need for validation. All this stuff that happened, which I think that ultimately, I think all these, a lot of these problems we face, they are because we don't, they're not a, uh, they're they, they because we don't feel ourselves anymore. It's because we don't feel connected to ourselves and the world and people and the living planet from which everything else grows. And from this living connection can flow love into your life, which you can then express. I think it's just to be disconnected from this source. And we don't even acknowledge that there is a source, that the nature is alive and from which we grew. It's just really weird place in history we blended my friend <laughs> yes 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 indeed and it's not getting any better i mean i'm sure 
with uh, the lockdowns, I'm sure it's made things worse. Uh, uh, here in the United States, is definitely suppress even more the psyche of people. What about over there in Denmark? I think now you guys um, are open pretty much, right? We are pretty open. It was nice to come back to Denmark. There were no mess anymore, and we could just hug and hang out and go to it. So, so it, it's really nice here. Um, but I am sure that it has uh, made. But there maybe also have been some good things about it. It's given us some time to to rest and think and meditate and read and be with ourselves and our family and just sit with yourself without having these million things you have to do to familiarize yourself with yourself. Right? That can also be very healthy, I think. But, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, it's nice that it's uh, – I'm very glad that it's kind of over here. <laughs> <laughs> you can get out you can be a little bit more free well good to hear yeah. and uh, as we get towards the end what's uh, some advice you would have somebody is interested in ayahuasca or another uh, psychedelic because your book doesn't just deal with ayahuasca you do cover other entheogens in the later chapters as well again a complete book but what advice do you have for people um, I think I said the most important ones. I said that research the shaman, research the medicine, do your homework, meditate before, um, respect the dieta before and after, um, and then maybe not jump into ayahuasca as the first thing. <laughs> I just really? meditation, maybe drumming first, and then I would personally recommend mushrooms first um, because it's. It's not mushrooms can be absolutely incredible, powerful. I'm not saying that it isn't. It's just less. <laughs> it doesn't just yeah, speak you up crazy. like yeah. ayahuasca. Does. You're in, yeah, so, you're in, yeah. you're in, and you're going for a ride with ayahuasca. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, I think that would be my uh, that would be my tips. Yeah, and what about, I think mine would be, uh, don't have any expectations. Don't, yeah, good one. Uh, just don't think it's going to cure this and it's going to do that. Just, uh, again, let the spirits take you where they need to go, where you need to go, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, ve very nice. And I think it's it's okay to have an intention, uh, uh, an intention, but where, then leave it, you know? They don't cling to it. Don't try to hold on to it. Don't try to control the experience because... I really like the idea that um, the ayahuasca vine uh, shapes to yourself like it shapes to the vine on which it grows. It adapts mm. to your being and just have faith that it knows what's going on and what's what works. Right? It's just, yeah. <laughs> Beautifully said and, and, and great advice. And for the audience, I definitely highly recommend you get uh, Grandmother Ayahuasca, it's a good book. It's an encompassing book. It's got all the science, the research. It's got the, again, you document the experiences of people, the studies, the history of it. And you bring in all these wonderful philosophers who are trying to understand the nature of reality and the nature of what it is to be a human being. So, uh, and the, obviously the history and anthropology of these uh, tribes in uh, South America who've been exploring and have experienced uh, these spirits and the plants. So good book and uh, really appreciate you coming on Finding Hermes, uh, Christian, and uh, good luck with everything. Uh, where can people find out more about you? Do you have a presence on the internet? I, uh, I don't have too much of a presence on the internet. Um, I, I guess my, my email, if you want something, that's just info and then the name of the book, Grandmother Ayahuasca, and then dot com. Um, so yeah, just anything if you want to reach me there and there and i just want to say thank you so much for having me it's been great and it's been a pleasure and it's been nice to meeting you as well oh great interview and uh good luck with all your other journeys regardless thank if it, they're literary or mystical <laughs> <laughs> yeah maybe both <laughs> thank you thank you and there you have it another great interview on finding hermes with christian thunder i hope uh, as always that you have now more tools in your toolbox or future tools or opportunities and choices that's what we do here and it's always up to you as i say you are a unique spiritual being that has unique needs and nothing wrong with trying new things and mix and matching um 
I think, uh, or as I've said before, doing uh, 110 hours of meditation is like doing one session of shamanistic ayahuasca. So it depends what you need and how you need it, but both and others will certainly open those channels of communication and facilitate your interior journey. It depends, again, how intense you need it to be or how fast you need to get to where you need to get. And it's always a little bit of experimentation, but the journey is definitely worth it. As some of you might have noticed, I sort of uh, didn't uh, put out a show, a Finding Hermes in October. And that happens. I mean, I'm very appreciative of Vance and the production he does and being a co-host. I appreciate Nate coming on and helping out. I appreciate Luthien being the webmaster and others of you who help a lot, like uh, Sunshine Valerie. But when it comes to most everything else, including scheduling, that's me, so it's sometimes a little Dionysian. But as before, when I've skipped a show, or more like skipped a month, I usually make it up, and I will make it up this November. In a few weeks... I will be hosting Gigi Young, and she will be sharing her ideas, well, on how to deal with depression, anxiety, and mental disorder in this age of Hermes, from her perspective of a psychic, a researcher on UFO, and uh, some of fascinating mysticism. So excited to have Gigi, and stay tuned. One thing you probably noticed too that I keep repeating is the idea of destroying your worldview and getting a new worldview. Uh, this reminds me of when Tony Robbins said that sometimes we have to change our beliefs, destroy our old beliefs. And yes, Tony is obviously getting it from NLP, so it's nothing new under the sun. And um, we tend to believe that our beliefs are somehow ingrained or an essential part of who we are. But the truth is that they are programmed. They are programmed into us from our culture, our family, our religions. And they are not essential to us, to our journey. It's not like if you uh, change your beliefs, you're going to turn into a puff of smoke all of the sudden. No, beliefs can be changed, and beliefs is how we tend to see our society, our relationships, uh, how we deal with other people, or who are our expectations of where we need to be with our careers, our, or even our spiritual paths, and they can be changed. They really can. An example is, um, this one was brought to me by Jessa Reed, and that is uh, the dad idea that somehow we need to turn off the lights in the house. And I was sort of a victim of this, the energy and worry of turning off the lights in the house. And when it comes down to it, when I did some reflection, I realized that, uh, yeah, that's saving 20 to $50 a month. I'll turn around and spend that on a, on a sudden meal or buy something on the internet. So it's not that really, it's not that big of a deal. And I can find other ways to help the environment if I wanted to. And I have. Uh, so these days, I just sort of let it go. I lead by example. I go around and I just turn off lights. I try to uh, explain to the kids uh, why it's good to turn off lights, and I don't worry about it too much. And uh, it's a small belief, but the energy you save, well, it's a lot more than uh, <laughs> turning off the lights in the house. It turns off. It turns on a light in your head and your soul. So that's an example of a small belief you can change. Uh, the thermostat, ooh, that's one as a man, as a dad, I'm still holding on to uh, pretty tightly. But we're all works in progress. So change your beliefs and change your worldview and see if that aligns with your soul and your soul will grant you uh, more serenity and more avenues for you to find your authentic self and open those channels of communication. I'd like to also quote from Anthony DeMello's Awareness. Yes, I keep quoting him, but uh, he's just amazing. And in one uh, part of his book, Awareness, 
he does talk about uh, changing beliefs and our worldview, but he goes from the perspective of our attachments. We get attached to things, and one of our beliefs is that it's easy to stop our attachments, and that's sort of a trick of the demiurge. And there are other ways of doing it, and I'd like to share with you uh, from awareness. Let me know what you think. Anytime you're practicing renunciation, you're deluded. How about that? You're deluded. What are you renouncing? Anytime you renounce something, you are tied forever to the thing you renounce. There's a guru in India who says, Every time a prostitute comes to me, she's talking about nothing but God. She says I'm sick of this life that I'm living. I want God. But every time a priest comes to me, he's talking about nothing but sex. Very well. When you renounce something, you're stuck to it forever. When you fight something, you're tied to it forever. As long as you're fighting it, you are giving it power. You give it as much power as you are using to fight it. This includes communism and everything else. So you must receive your demons. Because when you fight them, you empower them. Has nobody ever told you this? When you renounce something, you're tied to it. The only way to get out of this is to see through it. Don't renounce it. See through it. Understand its true value and you won't need to renounce it. It will just drop from your hands. But of course, if you don't see that, if you're hypnotized into thinking that you won't be happy without this, that, or the other thing, you're stuck. What we need to do for you is not what so-called spirituality attempts to do. Namely, to get you to make sacrifices, to renounce things. That's useless. You're still asleep. What we need to do is to help you understand, understand, understand. If you understood, you'd simply drop the desire for it. This is another way of saying, if you woke up, you'd simply drop the desire for it. Well said, Father DeMello, and I think we can call that Gnosis a deep understanding of reality and a deep ex embedded experience with the all. So get that gnosis and don't fight things, don't run away from things because then you're tied to them. Understand them, see through them. Yes, that really is gnosis as the Gnostics uh, contended thousands of years ago. Lastly, I want to remind you about uh, my new ebook, 10 Snackable Meditations. Uh, it's been selling well. The reception has been very positive. People have told me these techniques, these sanity hacks are really working from them. So I want you to uh, get it and check it out because I think you'll find something that will work for you and only you for your unique spiritual constitution or makeup. And it's got plenty of exercises from Buddhism, from Christianity, Islam, New Age, occultism. I've got an exercise from Damien Eccles, an exercise from Gurdjieff, his self-aware exercise, and a lot more. Uh, many of you have told me that you want it uh, as a paperback, Kindle, and audiobook. And yes, I am listening to you, and I am working hard to get it out very soon. Uh, so you can have this in the format you need. If you need a paperback to put it in your po back pocket and take it with you to not seize the day, but save the day so you can get to your next spiritual practice. Or if you need some of these meditations when you're driving to work or uh, going for a walk or jogging, I'll get it to you. So check out 10 Snackable Meditations. And thanks for those of you who have bought it and the feedback that you have given me. Well, that's about it. And again, a Finding Hermes should be in the near future. So I hope, as I keep saying, that uh, you're finding the keys to walk through those doors with the God of the mind, that you are laying your cards down on the table, and you are becoming transparent to the transcendent, as both Mary Magdalene and Joseph Campbell said. Thank you. Mm -hmm.